Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners and murder cases from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. And it's episode 71. Woo! 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 <laughs> it was anticlimactic, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was, yeah. What are we doing with our lives, Nick? <laughs> We're excited by numbers every week. Yes, how indeed. are you, Nick? Um, how, 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 how is Nick? Man, how is man, Nick? Man, mm. man, 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 man. <laughs> I feel weird. <laughs> Do you want to explain to the dear listeners why? Well, for good reason. I had my second jab yesterday, so I'm now fully jabbed. I can lick everything in sight. Woohoo! And everyone. Um, but it's made me feel a bit weird. You've got a bit weird with it. I have got a bit weird with it. Yeah, I had my second jab last week. I had no side effects, but I have been tired for about a week. And even Sleepy. though I'm feeling weird, Sinead has still, at gunpoint, forced me to write a podcast episode <laughs> and come up with a cocktail and said, no, you're fucking doing it, whether you like it or not. Here I am, suffering horribly. We'll just eliminate the whole thing where I say, would you like me to do, like, help out or anything like that? No, yeah, that, no, that's that, forgotten. That, that never happened. And yes, me at gunpoint, because this... This podcast exists just between the two of us in our heads. Well, dear <laughs> listeners, you know how Nick feels about the situation. Any poisonings this week, apart from yourself? Myself. Myself, with all <laughs> the jabbertiness. But good poison. Well, no, absolutely. I can't, I can't argue with that. Medicinal. Medicinal poisonings. <laughs> it's the way forward. <laughs> I think this medicine malarkey will catch on. Absolutely. Sometimes someone will do something with it. <laughs> <laughs> You have lost your I mind. I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> well, speaking of medicinal poisonings and losing your mind, I think it's time for us to thank our very, very sexy Patreon subscribers. Uh, who have also lost their mind in excitement about being Patreon subscribers. Um, <laughs> so I have no idea what's going on. This bodes well. This is going to possibly be either the weirdest or the greatest episode we've ever recorded. Shut up. Thank you so much to, to Megan Vining. To Christian Richards. And to Kelsey Perry. Darling people. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're very, very beautiful. You're very, very sexy. We love you. We, we also do. have a couple of special shout outs this mm. week. Now, we love to do a shout out. If you ever want one, just drop us a DM. Within reason, don't ask us to do anything weird. Well, actually, you know what? Give it a go. Well, all we'll do is <laughs> block do you. do a lot but... of weird stuff. Well, actually, yeah. So our first <laughs> shout out is to Andrew Burke, dear, dear, darling listener, and Chelsea Schiffer from Ohio, who are getting married married on the 17th of July. By the time they're listening to us, they may be uh, husband and wife. They may be listening while trying to calm their nerves before the wedding. Or <laughs> as potentially as walking down the aisle to the Poisonous Cabinet. Should we send them the theme music and she could no, I think walk down the aisle? <laughs> just, just an episode entertaining the congregation as they go. Okay, Nick, in a really weird voice, let's do the wedding march music. Come on, come on, come on. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Well, good luck on your wedding day with, with us behind you. Congratulations on your marriage. Enjoy your honeymoon in Mexico. And please do, as you promised, drink all the mezcal while you are there. Second shout out from one of our gorgeous Patreon subscribers, Chris Ollinger. Chris does amazing charitable work and we wanted to give his organisation a little bit of a shout out this week. He started the Gwen Fund. The Gwen Fund is a non-profit animal welfare organisation based in Atlanta, in Georgia, and they're focused on providing financial assistance for critical veterinary care, palliative care and after death care. The reason they started out this fund is to make sure that no one who has a, a sick animal as a pet owner feels that they have to resort to premature euthanasia rather than letting their pets be in pain because they can't afford the veterinary bills. We all know that veterinary bills are really, really high. This whole fund is there to assist people so they never have to face that dilemma. Please check it out, the Gwen Fund. Dot org. Find them on Facebook, find them on Instagram, on LinkedIn. We will share links to them on our social media. But really wonderful organisation that Chris set up because of his own experiences. So please do check them out. Well, Nick... Hello. Are you ready? <laughs> I don't know. To drink cocktails and talk about poison? Mm. Or mm. we could drink poison and talk about cocktails. That's a tempting option, I give you, uh, to be honest with you. <laughs> I, I'm worried that you're going to mix up the vials in the kitchen <laughs> and that is actually what we're going to yeah, end up could doing. Well, could well happen, could well happen. We could just end up drinking poison and talking about poison. Yeah. You never know. Well, should we go with the first one on principle? Oh, let's, as we normally do. Okay, hooray, hooray, hooray. It's Nick's story this week, but we can't, we can't, we can't possibly have a story without a cocktail in hand. As you know, dear listeners, each week we pick a secret ingredient that is inspired by the tale that we tell that will flavour 
our cocktail of the week. Next story this week. Here's pick for the secret ingredient. Yes. Mm. So this week's secret ingredient mm. is. I must admit, I struggled with this one. Did you? This was a, this was a tricksy one. This Did you week. now? We've gone for something. <laughs> Could be interesting, and it is story related, which is what we always aim for. That is the whole point. Yeah. Yes. Halfway through, I thought I'd just go. Oh, I can make an orange. He had an orange once. <laughs> and that would be the link. But I thought, no, I must <laughs> uphold the values of the poisonous cabinet. Orange will always be the backup. Yes. Let's just say that. <laughs> when we really get stuck, we go, he had an orange. He, and you'll he saw know one we're lying. in a museum once. And therefore, that's the ingredient. When was this? Oh, it's way back. Way back. <laughs> I can't wait for the orange episode now. But it's not an orange. It's not an orange. We have gone with the must. Dash. The moustache, the, the moustache, if you only, only got a moustache. Oh, I love that song. <laughs> and a moustache. I, I I like this. I like this as an ingredient because uh, I like yeah. moustaches. Okay. Twirly, twirly goodness. Twirly, twirly goodness. Shout Absolutely. out to Ollie from History Emporium Podcast. <laughs> Uh, it is inspired by you, as everything that we do is oh, inspired quite. by you, Ollie. And your magnificent moustache. Magnificent it is. <laughs> but this moustache is, in fact, inspired by the tale. People were frightened. Uh, but I'm wisely, I feel. They were worried that hair would be yes. part of the and drink. And you may have noticed, my moustache is somewhat reduced today. Is it? <laughs> So I genuinely was looking like, has he bloody trimmed his moustache and is just out in his COVID vaccine haze, just put moustache trimmings in my drink. It's a lovely garnish. Just to laugh. No, no, no. I no. haven't done that. No. Oh, good, what good What banter God. we have. <laughs> well, with moustache as the ingredient, what on earth have you come up with? Well, I haven't actually used a moustache as an ingredient. Did you put on a big fake moustache while, while mixing? making it? While making it. If only I had. There was another option. I thought, oh, I get a moustache strainer. Have oh, you they seen do. those? You can yes. get little strainers that you have over. You get them on julep glasses. So when you're mm. in the deep south and you're sitting on your porch with your big fancy moustache, you put it over your cup to stop you're getting bits of mint and things in your moustache. So I thought, oh, that'd be good, but I don't have any of those either. Oh, and also, moustache. your gesture of your big moustache, you put your hands out way past your head. I mean, yeah, absolutely. How big are the moustaches oh, in the Deep South? You just wait. <laughs> <laughs> so this week, we've gone for a slightly simpler interpretation of the moustache. Okay. With a cocktail named. Yes. The Sharpie Moustache. The what? The Sharpie Moustache. The Sharpie Moustache? Where the mustache? Sharpie bit comes in, I've got no fucking idea. I was in like a Sharpie pen well, where you draw so. it. Yes. S-H-A-R-P-I-E. That's what it's called. It's called the Sharpie Moustache. Okay. If that is inspired by someone named Sharpie who made it or was inspired by it, I do not know. Um, but that is the name of the cocktail we are having today. Oh, it must be you use a Sharpie to draw a moustache on a poster well, or a picture this somewhere. Is a bit, this is a bit fancy, this, though, this one. So oh, is it? I'm not sure it will have that sort of thing. I do not know. Well, an interesting name. Well, I'm intrigued to try it. Mm. I think without further ado, it is time for us to go into the Poisoner's Cabinet Kitchen and shake up a storm. So we'll see you in a minute. I'll see you in a bit. And we're back. Hello. So, Nick, a sharpy moustache we have in front of us. Yeah. It's a curious one. It looks like... I'm going to tell you, it looks like a Coca-Cola drink. It does. It's a, it, the quantities are a lot greater than I had anticipated from yeah. the recipe I followed. So there's a lot more in the glass. And I have an awful lot of ice in there. Yes. I think it, does, it will benefit for some dilution. Well, it's, um, it's most definitely brown. Very, very dark brown. Most definitely brown. I have a suspicion that you are going to absolutely hate it. Um, oh, oh, what and why? I have a suspicion that I might hate it also. Oh, um, God. Oh, is this going to be a disaster? I, well, I think it's going to be an interesting one. Oh, the brown drink is going to let us down. So, well. Well, who knows? We'll find out. All right. Okay. Well, yeah, it's a curious looking one. It's looking long and refreshing and brownie. So I guess we dive into the Sharpie moustache. dive too much. Oh, sip, sip, <laughs> little sip, 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 a little sippy, sippy one. Okay. Well, let's have, yeah. a, let's have a taste. All right. Well, yeah. we'll down the hatch. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Okay. Oh, oh, um, I, uh, I stand very much corrected, as yeah. always. <laughs> it's okay. It's, uh, I was worried that there was going to be some sort of assault on the senses there a little bit too much. No, but, I, um, as did I. I thought there would be, ooh. but it's actually a lot. <laughs> Subtle than I thought it was going to be. No, Nick is very, very pleasantly surprised. No, you had set yourself up for this to be a total failure. I have. There's too much, far too much ice in there. Yes, there is too, too much ice, ice in there. there. You really enamored no, there's this There's too much suddenly. ice in that. I need to sort this out. Oh, okay. It's I'm going to... Oh, 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 he's getting I'm up. Going, he's I'm getting going. up. You can't stop me! We're gonna pause while Nick has a breakdown. <laughs> okay, wavy lines, wavy lines. Ooh, wavy lines, wavy lines. Okay, well, Nick has come back from storming out of the room to deal with the ice situation. Yes, I was very unhappy with it. You had a large glass and it was pretty full of ice with yep. this cocktail over it. So now Nick has reduced the ice quantity. Uh, I'm, gonna go, I'm gonna go in for my second yep. sip here. Okay. Um, I quite sure. I like that. I'm surprised. 
I don't think that's world but personally. It's not, I don't it's think not, it's it's not, world it's not the most exciting cocktail in the history of the world, but I certainly think it's pleasant. It's certainly um, more your cup of tea yes, than it, it is. is mine. Yes. But I don't object to it. I can't work out what's in it. I, there's oh, a couple of guesses. Uh, it's red vermouth, isn't there it? Is red red vermouth. vermouth. Yeah. There is something medicinal tasting in there. Yeah. Is it Jaeger? It's not. Is it not Jaeger? It's not Jaeger. You are damn close, though, and you won't get it. Benedictine. <laughs> no. A, a small can of taboo. <laughs> <laughs> damn, you found me out. <laughs> um, I really don't know what else is in there. I don't know what accounts for the brownness. Um, so I think you need to talk us through it because it's, it's, I will say whatever's in there, it's not a taste sensation when you start to me to me it isn't it's a little bit well, there's something herbal in there it's fine but it's, i it's, cannot it really work out what it me. is oh really yeah is nick is in heaven right now <laughs> yeah so or we start we have a base of these are all there's four things in it all booze all in equal <laughs> equal quantities so we have gin oh okay we have a gin in there yeah we have a revmouth as you say yeah. We have rye. Oh, a rye. We've got rye in there. Ah. And then we have another thing. We have Amaro Averna. Uh, and uh, Blugada Boogada, <laughs> you too, sir. What? So Amaro. Yeah. Amaros are a type of Italian spirit. Basically, your Campari is an Amaro. Oh. Aperol. Even things like Jaeger and Unicum. It's that sort of bitter, herby mm. thing. Mm. They've got, they come under this umbrella term of Amaros. Um, that's all that and then you have loads and loads and loads of different ones now I must admit this particular cocktail the exact recipe calls from Amaro Maletti which I do not have and I was not going to go and spend 40 quid on a bottle for the one cocktail <laughs> yeah fair enough, fair <laughs> so, enough. but I did have an Amaro Averna in the cupboard oh. which I thought is very very similar your Amaro sort of heading is much like sort of your whiskey mm. um, and there is un- beneath that there are a lot of different things so you have a lot of different flavours within mm. the whiskey sort of category and Amaro is much the same so you've, you can, you've got things yeah from your Campari and Aperol things right the way through to Jaeger and lots of other bits and pieces in between definitely bitter so it's bitter bitter bit herby aromatic. medicinal yeah um, even at a push you would, you would include like chartreuses and things like that because it's that herbal bitteriness in that category as well no I don't think you'd categorise pure evil in there. <laughs> and then I've also put a dash of orange bitters in there as well oh um, Interesting. Um, it is very much that sort of mm. the bitter after dinner sort of yeah. aperitif type drink. It's not one to start, let's go and have a party. Let's have one of these. <laughs> it is not when someone walks through the door, you hand them that and they go, what no. are you doing to me? What this, did I ever do to you? No, indeed. This, this, is, your, this is your late night Digestive. after a meal in front of the fire type Ooh, yeah. just before you go to bed type drink i can imagine that i can imagine that if you're quite yeah. full then you're gonna want to have something like this to cut <laughs> through for me it is in that medicinal category i either prefer them straight and even then i'm kind of like eh, i'm not so sure about it on this scale on this end of the scale campari fine delicious lovely and lots of things but yeah this it does have that those hints of jaeger and, and and then the dreaded unicum. <laughs> to me, it's a little bit too medicinally too medicinal herbal, spectrum. but it's not it's not bad. For some people, would hate it. Oh god, gotcha. yeah. Absolutely. Others would really really appreciate yeah. this when you're into your cocktails. It's the sort of thing I can imagine in years for years to come, years or something like when you're really full after a big meal, be <laughs> like, oh, that's exactly what I need yeah. right now. Something to cut through. And make me feel like I'm drinking cough syrup. I don't know. <laughs> you love it. I though. do. I really enjoy it. No, it's getting, it's, it's growing on me. It really is. It is doing everything that Nick wants and it's, Nick yeah. needs right now. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, you've got your gin and tonic as well, so you have that. It's um, a shit name, though. A, it, a moustache on its own. Yeah, uh, the, the sharp. There must be a reason for the sharpie portion. I, I of mean, it. I can't imagine um, that it's anything other than drawing a sharpie moustache on someone. How how old is maybe. this cocktail? Oh, it's, we know? it's not that. It's not that old. No, the, but the, um, there we go. Then sharpie yeah. moustache. That's an awful name for quite a sophisticated drink. You need mm. to have a damn good palate to enjoy this, as yeah. Nick does. Let's just call it the moustache for us, uh, or, or you know, in England, as we would say, the tash. The tash. The tash. That's better. Okay, well, with our moustaches d- twirled around our fingers. Twirled, indeed. With yours yeah. firmly in hand, you're running away with it down into a corner to sit by a fire somewhere I'm and I'm left in the doorway kind of going, I guess this is okay. Oh my God, it's literally like a double date and you've been matched up with your perfect person and I've been left with the reject that they brought along. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly like that. Okay. <laughs> is it time for a story, Nick? Yes. Yay! Yay. So, we're off. Yay! So this week's tale starts on the other side of the world. Ooh. Far, far away. Ooh. In the quiet Melbourne suburb of <gasps> Windsor. Ooh, 
Australia. So we are Australia. We are off to Australia. And indeed, it is the 3rd of March, 1892. Oh, nice. Jack um, the Ripper. Yes. <laughs> I, I, I'm, we'll finish now. Bye. <laughs> And police have, say, police have just arrived at 57 Andrew Street, where they have been sent to investigate vile smell coming from the building. They find the building abandoned. A few old boxes and papers scattered around, but no signs of recent life. They s follow the increasing odour into the dining room, and they find the, the powerful smell is coming from the fireplace. No... Oh. The officers crowbar up one of the large stones in the hearth, and beneath they find the decomposing body of a young woman embedded in the cement. Ooh. Fun times. Oh, so she's been in the very foundations of the yes, house. Yes, she's been buried in the fireplace. Fuck. <laughs> a post-mortem reveals that the woman's throat has been cut. And that she's been dead for around three months. Oh, God. So, yes, in some ripe condition when it is discovered. Oh. Detective Sergeant Considine and Corsi are both assigned to the case. And they begin checking out the cottage's previous tenants. It is a man named Druin. And speaking to the locals in the area, they find an, uh, they find an ironmonger who had sold Druin some cement. And a broom. And a trowel. And a spade only a few weeks earlier. It's a very well stocked ironmonger. <laughs> well, he has all the things. He has all the things you need. It's your one stop shop for all yes. your burying it, people needs. He raised no concerns as his man went up and listed these things out. And he's like, okay. <laughs> well, your first thing is that this man is doing some building work. No. Not no, this not. man is going to bury someone in his under his fireplace. You know what? In 1892, maybe. In this day and age, we all know if anyone asks for those things. If this podcast has taught you nothing, people suspect the people asking for shovels oh, and cement. Yes, especially if they're going to their local ironmonger for it. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. And if they're twirling a moustache. <laughs> So the ironmonger describes uh, Druin as being in his mid-thirties, fair-haired, with a, a, a reddish beard and a large, distinctive moustache. Is that it? <laughs> oh, you just wait. Ooh, okay. <laughs> he was of medium height and slight build. The ironmonger also reported that Druin was incredibly flamboyant in his oh. manner, dressed with an awful lot of jewellery, and spoke loudly and confidently in, with an English accent. In the house, the detectives find um, a torn luggage ticket, as one of the scraps of paper that had been oh. left lying around, and they trace it back, and they find that Mr. Druin has arrived in Melbourne from the UK a few months earlier on the ship, the Kaiser Wilhelm II, accompanied by his young wife. Time they had been travelling under the name Albert and Emily Williams. <laughs> the detectives question other passengers from the ship, mm. um, and they have no trouble whatsoever remembering Mr. Williams. <laughs> sounds, um, sounds like they wouldn't. He had been loud, boastful. He had bored anyone he could with his obviously fictional tales of his, his travels all over the world and his adventures. He reportedly, repeatedly offends the ship's crew by accusing them of stealing he and his wife's valuables, going into their <laughs> cabin and stealing their things. And everyone is incredibly pleased to see the back of Mr. Williams. It's always one on holiday. Absolutely, yeah. It's like on a cruise, it's like, just fuck off, you're really annoying. <laughs> Not that I've been on a cruise, but I imagine that's the way. Um, I imagine a cruise is awful. Yeah, I've got to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the police unsurprisingly suspect that the woman beneath the fireplace is the wife Emily. The two detectives issue a nationwide alert for Albert Williams and a description for Williams or aka Druin is sent to every police station in Australia. It doesn't take too long before a man matching Williams' description is reported. He had been seen boarding a ship that had sailed on the 23rd of January from Melbourne to Perth. The flamboyant Mr. Williams had been noted by his outrageous and, and excessive behaviour. Well, I was going to say that, I mean, when they say, Let, let's look for this incredibly flamboyant, jewel-covered man <laughs> strutting around, twirling yeah. a cane and his moustache at the same time, you'd probably notice. Yes, yeah, indeed. And this time... He is travelling under the name of Baron Swanston. Oh, God, yes. Oh, oh yes, <laughs> he's the Baron, up, the He's Baron. up to the level. He is now a Baron. Fuck it, why not? Well, why the hell why not? not? Absolutely. Not? Police immediately issued a wanted poster to every town, city and settlement in Western Love Australia. Love a wanted poster. Trying to find Baron Swanston. And it's a, it turns out he's not that hard to locate, really. Um, <laughs> his very boisterous nature, his fancy jewellery that has never come off, his city clothes, mm. his large, distinctive moustache, <laughs> and his English accent stand out a mile away. Is he the sort of person who's just leaving a trail of jewels in his way? Pretty way? much. <laughs> he makes sure everyone knows he's there and he's been there. He he's wants not to being be the centre of attention. He's the least subtle man I've ever heard about. And is he, how big is the moustache? 
<laughs> you look at pictures; it's actually not that. It's not that big. I mean, it's it's a decent it's a decent size. It, it does come big, out big. Oh, considerable. Yeah, yeah. It does. It, it twirly edges. He's very long them. and spiky. Oh, okay. So it is distinctive. The day after Emily is buried in Melbourne, the trooper wires the the Melbourne detectives to report that Baron Swanston has been found in the small mining settlement of Southern Cross in the remote gold fields of Western Australia. The Baron has taken a job as an engineer at the Fraser Gold Mine, but he had been found and he is now safely under lock and key, okay. awaiting instruction from the detectives. Well, he took a job as an engineer? He's, he, yep, he's gone out there, he's bluffed his way into, into a job, probably quite a relatively well-paid job as one of the engineers on the gold mine. A office job, office job. For yeah, him. office yeah. or looking after the machinery, overseeing many, many people. Who Turning probably... up in his resplendent outfit Absolutely. and jewels his, his, with he... a token hard hat on, going, oh, I, think... I shall look after all the machines. I think hard hats were not a thing at this point. He'd fashioned <laughs> one out of diamonds. <laughs> but now he has been imprisoned, oh, so no. he has now been locked away. Indignity. News of the arrest of Durin slash William slash Swanston quickly makes its way across Australia. Papers declare Windsor murder arrested. Back in Melbourne, the detectives Constantine and Corsi have been continuing their investigations as well into their suspect, and they've discovered yet another name. They know this time it is not an alias. They have identified the real man, and the name is Frederick Bailey Deeming. Ooh, I mean, it mean, <laughs> means uh, nothing. Uh, <laughs> Deeming uh, sounds uh, seeming. No, I've never heard of that. Deeming. <laughs> oh, he sounds evil. Deeming, they discover, had arrived from England in 1881 okay. with his wife Marie and a young family. Oh. He operated a gas fitting shop in Sydney until the store mysteriously what? burnt down. In my brain, my stupid, stupid brain was kind of, how do you fit gas? <laughs> and, oh no, the fixtures. The, the and fixtures like, yeah, for yeah, the lighting the and things and, and the so pipes forth. and the, the switches and the valves and things. Yes, and he didn't just lighting. have a shop full of gas. He didn't have, just like he's selling bags of gas, <laughs> basically. Here, come and buy your gas. <laughs> Five pence a bag of gas. And it's shocking that that place burnt down. Well, he, he's not storing the gas on the property. <laughs> exactly. He hasn't got, got bags boxes of gas. Of boxes of gas. In <laughs> Ushering the... it into a hat box and then handing it over. I think you no. may not really know how, how I, I things work. I have no idea how things work. <laughs> that thought sincerely inhabited me there for a minute. Right. So you regularly get your gas delivery for your your, your hob at home I and do. things. Right, moving on. People who remember Deeming described how everyone... It was an open secret, that, and everyone knew that Deeming had in, burnt down the store himself yeah. for the insurance money. It turns out that he'd even been imprisoned for a few weeks for theft from a previous employer. Oh. So he's not obviously not a very trustworthy chap. They also remember how Deeming was quite the expert at drawing attention to himself. He did like the attention. Neighbours and friends also remembered his wife. Marie. And she is nothing at all like the description of Emily Williams found at the house in Melbourne. She is different in every way. She's older, shorter, a darker complexion. And it's looking like there had been two Mrs. Deemings. But where was the original one? And what of the children? Oh, God. Oh, God. Well, they indeed, went they they way to know. a farm and lived happily ever after. They lived after. happily ever after. The happily end. ever after. Oh, God. oh okay. With Deeming still locked up in Southern Cross, hmm. uh, where he'd been posing as an engineer. <laughs> Badly. He, he was waiting for transport to Melbourne to face a murder charge. The detectives set about trying to find the missing Mrs. Deeming and the children. Um, again, the only lead they find is again crum a crumpled up bit of paper in the house in Melbourne. It is an invitation to a dinner party. Oh, lovely. Which is very fancy. Held at the commercial hotel Rain Hill in England. Oh. The soiree had been held by Mr. Albert Williams. Oh. It turns uh, out that Albert Williams might have existed after all. Was he, in fact, a real chap whose, whose name had been usurped by this other man? Or had he held this fancy party in Rain Hill? Did he go to there? Does he have the invite and that's where we got the name from? Ooh, Detectives okay. are asking the, exactly the same questions. Yeah. What's going on? I so they too. telegraph the Lancashire police going, can you have a look into this? Um, can you try and track down this Mr. Williams um, mm -hmm. and see if he can shed any light on this missing wife and, the, and family? The police inquiries in Lancashire lead them to a Rainhill news agents, mm -hmm. which was run by Mrs. Mather. The officers ask her if she knows Albert Williams, where they can find Albert Williams. I do, she says. I do know Albert Williams. <laughs> <laughs> Weren't expecting that one, were you? Neither was I. <laughs> 
I was wondering, are you going to do the accent? No, 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 no. No, you're just, just going to go with that. a woman who was just surprised <laughs> yes, by sur- everything. Surprised woman. No! I do, I do, I do, I do, I do from Lancashire. Turns out he was her son-in-law. <gasps> no. Yeah, indeed. But he's not here. He's no. not here. He's on honeymoon in Australia with his lovely new wife. Oh, bloody hell. She says, my daughter, my daughter, he married my daughter. She's off on honeymoon. Detectives quickly realise that the body found at the Melbourne house is Emily Mathers, the woman's daughter. Oh, no. Oh, oh bloody hell. Oh, mind blown. It's a very Sorry. convoluted what? plot of many names so and he's, confusions. I'm literally grabbing my head at the moment. <laughs> so he's travelled over with a woman and two kids. We don't know where they are. Yeah. But now it transpires that the woman who was under the fireplace. Yeah. Is the daughter of this poor lady the in poor Lancashire? Poor lady in Lancashire, absolutely. Who's saying, "Oh, they were on honeymoon." They were on honeymoon. So recently married. What? And how? Well, how the hell did she get over there yeah. with the other women? Where, I mean, where's... I know we've got a gap of. Uh, but, but, uh, what? Hopefully, all of them come clear. Okay, I'm going to keep <laughs> drinking this cocktail. This is why. Is this? I mean, this is the thing. It's like, I, I'm 100 percent behind you here, Nick. But there's a tiny part in the back of my head is going, "Is this a fever dream?" <laughs> potentially, potentially. <laughs> that you have made up because of the vaccine. Yep, it's yep. brilliant if it it's, is. It could make no sense. Edge of my seat. <laughs> Everyone's going to write, I have questions. What's going on here? <laughs> Mrs. Mathers describes how Albert Williams, or the man she knew was Albert Williams, had arrived in Rainhill in October 1891. He rented a house named Deenham Villa on the outskirts of the village, um, supposedly for his employer, a Colonel Brooks, um, who was due back on furlough from his service in India. What? Okay. While, <laughs> while waiting for the Colonel to arrive, um, Williams uh, lived at the local commercial hotel okay. where the invitation for the fancy party was, right. was oh, from. Right, right, right. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm with you. I'm with you. The Colonel came. The Colonel. Uh, and he made himself incredibly popular at the hotel. He was holding court in the bar every night, right. being very extravagant with his his generosity, buying drinks, spinning mm. tales of his global adventures. I mean, of course, the colonel does not exist and he never turns up. Oh, OK. Because a man such as Albert Williams, he would not have probably got such a fancy villa if because he probably came across as a, a lowly working class man sort of thing. Yes. This is a fancy villa for He's a fancy renting person. renting it for someone I'm else. renting it for my employer. Colonel Brown. Brooks, who was a relative of <laughs> Colonel Mustard. So, so there and we go. Then, so he's using his name so he's to using his live name. the high life at Absolutely. the hotel. Yes, he's in the hotel. The Colonel will pay for all this drinks. The Colonel will pay for it when he comes and takes the villa. Clever, clever. And everyone buys it. Everyone goes with it. Well, yeah. Emily Mathers certainly does. The young woman falls for him oh, instantly. No. His gregarious and his gregarious ways, his storytelling, his larger than life personality. And they are married on the 22nd of September, 1891. Williams, he throws a lavish reception at the commercial hotel before departing on honeymoon aboard the Kaiser Wilhelm II. Oh no, oh she she believed his she flamboyant believes ways. She's going to have an exciting look. Going to Australia on a honeymoon, even now, that's something exciting and grand. For, yeah. For the, for the time. Not going, being a criminal, that's amazing <laughs> going over. Going halfway across the world for this, oh. this little, yeah, young woman from a... Lancashire Village, honeymoon in Australia. Yeah. That is the most exciting thing that is ever going to happen to you in your life. Absolutely, and he's um, like kind of covered in diamonds and loveliness yeah. and everything. Yeah, gotcha. Fuck boy. But the detectives have still found no sign of the original Mrs. Deeming and the children. No, that they were originally Where set are out. They? Where, Where are they? the hell are they? Now, Mrs. Mathers, the, the mother, certainly didn't know of a previous wife. As far as she was aware, he wasn't a widow or anything like that. But then she remembers something. There had been talk amongst the locals of a woman and, and children living at Dynam Villa. She was sure that she had heard that it was William's sister and her children who had been visiting for a bit of a holiday before the colonel turned up. Uh, but they hadn't been seen for an awful long time. Um, and it just assumed that they had gone home to wherever it is they came from. Oh. A neighbour also remembered talking to a young boy and a girl one afternoon after they had asked if they could have some strawberries from his from his garden. Strawberries, Strawberry. Nick. <laughs> strawberries. Yep, I didn't get that one. <laughs> <laughs> My crazy fever dream of... I entirely missed strawberries. Who was right there? Ah, shut up. We could have had strawberries. Start it all again. Start over. <laughs> Do it again. Shut up. It's okay. Strawberries are quite common. They'll probably come up again. Yeah, well, indeed. Back. <laughs> Before the neighbour can say anything, the pair are called inside by a woman from the house, who then abruptly closes the door and draws all the curtains. There have been other Not briefs. Not suspicious at all. <laughs> Not in the slightest bit suspicious. There have been other brief sightings of the woman and her children by other neighbours, but now... They are nowhere to be found. They haven't been seen for ages. Mm. So the assumption is 
They've gone home to wherever it is they came from. End of story. Nothing weird there. Yeah, you wouldn't really you don't question that the because if the help is maybe let their family stay there for a yeah, little bit. Absolutely. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. And, and they, the they sister... shouldn't be there when the colonel arrives. Well, exactly. The sister and the nephews, they come to get away from the city, have a bit of time in a nice little countryside, mm-hmm. and then they're off again. No harm done. Totally. It's like living in a house if you're a, an estate agent yeah. until it's sold. That, that, <laughs> that doesn't happen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you were selling a mansion, you totally would. <laughs> I would. You would. Hence why I'm not an estate agent. It's probably wise. Probably wise. Don't mm. let Sinead sell your house. A police visit Dynam Villa. There's no answer. They break in to see what leads they can find. Okay. Excessive. Well, they know something's going on here. No William... They has... ring the bell once. There's no answer from the house. The colonel is obviously not there. Um... <laughs> One of the constables is really excited and has an axe. Yeah, exactly. Like, we could prepared. just open the door. It's not locked. No, we must no, break it. We must break it in. They, they break in to see what they can find and they are confronted by the most terrible, terrible smell. No. Oh, God, no. They trace the smell to the fireplace. Again? And just like in Melbourne, <gasps> when the police pull the fireplace apart with crowbars and shovels, they uncover human remains. No. This time it is a woman and two children. No. All in a very advanced stage of decomposition. The corpses are wrapped with oilcloth, with the woman upon her back and her two children are turned with their faces towards her, lying on one on either side. Oh, God, that's grim. With further investigation, they find another two children <gasps> embedded in the cement below the woman's feet. What? The woman and, the, and a nine-year-old girl have been strangled. The other three infants have had their throats cut. Oh, my God. Police find a book in the burial with a name... Deeming and it had been crossed out and replaced with Williams. Police are left with the little doubt that Deeming or Williams are in fact the same person. Th- that's horrific. It's, it's a terrible, that's terrible thing. Chilling. I do need to pick up on one thing. Yes. You've committed a, an horrific crime. Poor woman and those poor children that you've buried in the cement under the fireplace. You just put the book Why would there you leave the book? I know. With your name crossed out and another one written there. You were by a fireplace, mate. You were by a fireplace. <laughs> what is going on there? Huge overconfidence he has. These things are never going to found. It's never going to come up. It's never going to affect me again. I'm now off to the other side of the world. This is never going to come back to me. You don't. So, you don't bury a body with the assumption that it's going to be found. No. Well, indeed. Yeah. Indeed not. So he's just chucked this in I'm there. Told. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, that was a very. You, know, you just don't. So, no, you don't. Okay, no, okay. You don't, mate. You don't, mate. You don't, mate. Have I ever been accused of anything? No, obviously not. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, if you're gonna, if you're gonna murder children and their mother, and then just bury them like that, yes, you would have that level of arrogance. Of, Completely. Ugh, who cares? Here's yeah. my here's my new alias, and he's not a subtle man. He is not a subtle man. Absolutely not. Absolutely oh, not. Oh, I don't like it. An inquest is held. Uh, mm. over the deaths and two men come forward and identify the woman as Marie James that she and the children were the family of their older brother Frederick Deeming and they explained to the police that their brother Frederick had married Marie James in 1881 the two girls Bertha and Mary were born in Sydney okay. and in the mid 1880s the family spent some time in South Africa and their third child a boy named Sydney was born at sea they had returned to England in 1890 and had their fourth child the infant girl, Layla. And after a brief stay with the brothers, Deeming and his family then disappeared, apparently to Rain Hill, where Deeming had taken on Dynam Villa and kept his family hidden away while he right. merrily played the eligible bachelor about town. Whoa, okay. Happy with all that. There's a lot of, <laughs> lot of dates going yeah. on there. There's There's a a, lot of... <laughs> that's fine. I trust you. 100% it's probably right. I think from... Sydney and that's right and that, that but, uh, but okay so yes has a wife and these four children first what wife the hell first happened? wife four children goes to Australia where he's running his gas shop in Sydney yes yes comes back to the UK comes via back. South Africa where there are actually reports he's involved in a few sort of diamond frauds things but he ends up he needs up, to make a hat <laughs> he ends up back in the UK right stays with his brothers for a bit Minima. has their fourth child and then moves to Rain Hill where he's got Dynam Villa and has unfortunately killed his family. But then what's happened? What's happened? Why? What has led to their deaths in this house? Well, police, they reason that as soon as he meets Emily Mathers in the in the village, <gasps> at the local pub, he falls madly in love or something. Obviously, he's got a wife and family hidden away in the villa. Yeah. He thinks, no, I want to be with this younger, more attractive 
lovely young girl. No. Um, I want to marry. I want to marry her and run away back to Australia with her. What's the best way of doing that? Let's kill the family. Kill your entire Let's family. Kill the entire family. Hide their bodies in the fireplace. I can then remarry Emily Mathers and start my life all over again. Okay. <laughs> The discovery of these five bodies is on March the 16th, 1892. It was only two weeks after the body of Emily had been discovered in the identical circumstances in the house in Melbourne. Frederick Deeming, when he was found, had an awful lot of explaining to do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think questions. the police said that. No. <laughs> it rocked up with their hands on him. You've a lot, a lot of explaining, explaining to do, do, Mr. Deeming. Absolutely. Deeming, who at this point is in jail in the Southern Cross, is now taken by three armed constables mm. for a five-day train trip to Perth. Okay. Um, the train stops in various towns and each time a crowd has gathered to greet the man who has now been publicised, who has slaughtered his entire family and yeah. his second wife. And he is handcuffed throughout the trip and a, a strict watch is kept to make sure he doesn't try and escape or that no one gets in because <laughs> these people are not happy. When the train eventually arrives at Perth, the crowd is so large at the train station that instead of disembarking at Perth Central, Demi is taken off one stop before and jumbled into a van and driven the rest of the way <laughs> to avoid these crowds yeah. um, and the people who will just grab him. At the Perth courthouse, Deeming is put into the custody of Detective Causey. One of the chaps from Melbourne, yes. who was on his initial case. From Perth, they then begin the 250-mile overnight trip to Albany. Right. Where they will rendezvous with the SS Ballarat, which will take them on to Adelaide. And from there, they will get the train to the final leg back to Melbourne. I do mm -hmm. forget how fucking big Australia is. As Australia <laughs> is huge. It's very, very big. How terrifyingly large it is. Word passes down the line that this despised killer is going to pass through the local community soon yes. um, and at every stop an increasingly angry crowd gathers people shout for him to be dragged from the train lynch him mm. there's one account that someone shouts that he should be tied to between two bullocks and then and torn apart torn torn to pieces Whoa. such is the anger in Fair the, enough. the mob surge forward and surround the train and the sheer mass of people is enough to rock the train carriage on the rails wow. there's a big old train carriage there's yeah. many many tons so the amount the anger and the people trying to get in fortunately the doors hold and the crowds are kept at bay and the train eventually carries on its way to albany i mean this is their local entertainment it's not like well, quite, there's not much else to do <laughs> it's the equivalent of the premiere of love island each year you know? <laughs> they eventually make it to albany where they board the ship taking them to adelaide throughout the entire journey a trio of officers including detective corsi keep an hourly watch on their prisoner to ensure that no harm should come to him yeah. either by himself or by someone else breaking in to, to do him harm good stuff however in the morning the three guards are astonished what um to find that their prisoner is missing his most distinctive <gasps> feature uh, his large mustache his mustache is his gone. mustache what is entirely gone the loss of his mustache ex exposes a really wide ugly mouth it makes his large chin even more prominent his guards agree that he has been an excellent job of removing his moustache in the middle of the night considering he has no tools he has no razor or anything like that to do it in his clothes they find a piece of a glass bottle oh. about the size of a coin which he had used as a bit of a razor to what? do this okay but for the most part they find that he's actually plucked out each hair individually by the root of his moustache what's more he has done so in entire silence and without moving throughout the night so no one had noticed that he was doing this. Why? The detective, Corsi, is incredibly concerned about the missing moustache. Yeah. It made him look very, very different. The moustache was one of the key features that yes. had identified him. It's what witnesses grabbed onto to, to identify him as the culprit or as him the man they had seen. It's this big moustache. Oh. Without that, he looks like an entirely different person. Yeah. Could they really get witnesses to say, yeah, it's still him? And his picture has been shared across Australia. Yep. All these people have been lining up looking for this looking guy with for a big... This Man with a big moustache. With a big distinctive moustache. Absolutely. Now there's nothing. He's entirely sort of clean shaven. Planning something? Well, I think he's planning just to put that bit of doubt in people. If a nice. witness is called to the stand to say, is this the man you saw or is this the man you met five, ten years ago in Sydney? Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And they go, well, that man had a big moustache. Are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure it's this man? Can you be 100% sure that it's this man here? Mm-hmm. Can you put a big moustache on him? <laughs> yeah. Bring in the big moustache. Are you sure enough that if you get it wrong, he's going to die? That's a good, it's a good tactic. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a cunning, it's a cunning plan. Yeah. He knows it's a cunning plan. And it's, it's apparently a quiet sarcastic smile breaks over his face when he mm. notices the detective going oh fuck <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. this is a big part of our of our case yeah in melbourne he's formally charged with the murder of emily williams mm. uh, when asked his name he refuses to answer mm-hmm. so he is charged as albert williams mm-hmm. not his real name but that's the name he's gone by so that's the name they, they will charge him on. The trial begins on the 2nd of May, 1892. The defence plead not guilty, unsurprisingly, on the grounds of insanity. Six independent doctors examine Deeming several times, but not one of them is willing to state that he is insane. That is thrown out the window. Fair enough. The trial lasts four days, and evidence is quite damning, really, despite the removal of the moustache. Doctors suggested that he suffers from epileptic fits. Potentially. No. He certainly has syphilis, which they are able to prove, which they think may have affected his mind oh, okay. slightly. Okay, fair enough. VD, a can affect He's been your, shagging your around. Mind. Been shagging around a lot. When he speaks, he drifts between sort of moody and sullen to excitable and garrulous, the character that he's, he's known for. He fantasises all about his past glories that are pretty much all in his head. On one occasion, Deeming claimed that his dead mother had told him to kill Emily Mather. That is quickly dismissed as him trying to up the case for the insanity. Right, yeah. And they go, no, no, we don't believe a word of that one. (laughs) So you're just trying it on, mate. (laughs) So all in an Australian accent, obviously. You're not doing the accent. I'm not doing the accent. I'm very, 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 very poor. One of his doctors, one of the doctors who had examined Deeming, reports that he had told him several times that he had gone out with a revolver searching for women who had given him venereal disease, given him VD, and he had intended to kill them to get his revenge. What? (laughs) Yeah, sure, why not? Deeming, against the advice of his lawyers, decided to make his own closing statements, closing arguments. Um, Starting his statement saying, I don't think there's ever been a man brought into court that has ever been more prejudged more than I have been. It does not endure him to the jury. They, they, Everyone um, just sort of cracks their knuckles yeah, going, going, carry on, mate, yeah, carry, carry on. on, carry on. You poor white yeah. privileged man. He goes on picking up speed and his insatiable ego soon comes out. He begins to boast of all his conquests. It is not giving up life, I fear, not the slightest. I have gone through the world, the dangers I have faced. I am not afraid to give up my life. I have been on the Zambezi among the black fellows and have been battered about the head and gone among bears and gone into lion's caves and brought them out alive. He says he's done all these amazing things. <laughs> the, the jury are not entirely convinced um, <laughs> by his, his outbursts. Um, and he is sentenced to death for the murder of Emily Mathers. Good. Because yeah, normally you don't use the defence of I fought a lion I fought once, a lion and I won. That's and how great and amazing me. I am. <laughs> Like, yeah, but you still killed people. <laughs> well, he never stands trial for the murder of his wife or children in the UK. No. Um, but, but one is Emily enough. But he does yeah. for Emily Mathers. Yeah, as we all and know. And that's going to that's gonna get him. Frederick Deeming is executed on the 23rd of December, 1892. Good. Reports claim that he very casually walks towards the scaffold without a care in the world, <laughs> um, puffing on a large cigar as, as he goes, walking to the scaffold. Okay, fair enough. Oh, the story does not end there. Oh, oh. oh. Press across the world have picked up on this case, especially in the UK with the UK connection, um, where every aspect of Deeming's life is picked through for the entertainment of the masses. In London, one reporter picks out a tiny detail that was revealed by Deeming's doctors at the trial. The reporter fixates on how Deeming had said that he had gone out searching for women who he had believed had given him syphilis, Mm -hmm. uh, looking to kill them for revenge. This small comment is pulled apart. And when the reporter discovers that Deeming had been in the UK in 1888, Mm -hmm. there is only one possible conclusion to draw. Shut up. Frederick Deeming is Jack the Ripper. Shut No! No! (laughs) I joked at the (laughs) start. I did. Oh, my God. I thought, no, she's found me out. (laughs) (laughs) I had no idea. Of Of course. Of course. Of course. 
Of course he is Jack the Ripper. I mean, there's no other explanation. No, absolutely not. Jack the Ripper was resplendent in diamonds. He strutted <laughs> about Whitechapel guy. I've killed a hooker. Hello. <laughs> oh my God. No, 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 no. <laughs> that, yes. But yes, at the same time, yay for more Jack the Ripper suspects. <laughs> Just bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you that got so much press. Oh, absolutely more more so than the actual his actual crimes and stuff like that. Yeah. It was another. It was Jack the Ripper is dead. Jack the Ripper thing. is dead. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> A story of Frederick Bailey Deeming. You did it, Nick! I did it, Yay! I survived. My and God, it... that was rambling. <laughs> no, it was a really, really good story, Nick. I was 100% here for it. No, that was that got me. Nick, that got me. That got me. I didn't like that man. And the, well, oh, the lies, the lies, and the running across the, the, the world. And bloody hell. I mean, I, we've had some shits on this show. <laughs> we've had some absolute He's bastards. Yeah. But let's not gloss over the fact that just because he's fancied a new woman he shag someone else. murdered his entire four family kids. four kids four kids and, and his and wife and a newborn yeah oh. oh god no he is a shit of the highest order yeah, quite bastardometer is off the chart <laughs> right now oh he that's a good story though that's so I'm flamboyant i know so that he was recognized wherever he went people thought i remember that chap yeah <laughs> i remember him because he's such a nutter i mean that's crazy to think that I mean, we say it's crazy now because uh we've covered so many murderers and we all know the murder cases about like try to hide your crimes hide your crimes don't strut about the place with a cane and jewels and the best dress ever <laughs> and then shout at all the passengers on your ship on the way to australia and make complaints don't make yourself visible but clearly he didn't care he no, just well, thought indeed. he is so oh he was just so confident in his own skills yeah that um he's, he's never going to get caught or well if they do who the hell is going to believe them because i am that fantastic it chills me more to the bone maybe than than other things i suppose of the to have that level of arrogance to mm. do that to your family to do that to children to do that to a newborn and the way in which they died and then to just not have a care just to be no no this is perfectly acceptable oh. and i'm going to be my flamboyant self but why did he murder his his other woman. There were, there were some reports that I read that by the time he had got to Southern Cross, to the, mm. the, the mining um, settlement, he had proposed to another woman on the way oh, whose no. father had intervened and said, no, you're not good enough for my daughter. And that that, oh. married, that engagement never stuck. Um, but that was only in one or two of the reports. So I, I wasn't sure if that was accurate well, well, or just a... That's the thing. Is that thing. what happened? What about Emily? I mean, why did she end up under the fireplace? Who knows? Just got bored. I mean, he never obviously gave any explanation. Never gave and... any explanation as, as to why. Um, oh yeah, just God. just got bored. I want to go out and do new things. That is a weird case then, I suppose, that to build that he had killed her, not having a motive at the trial, apart from maybe greed, but basing it on the fact that he probably did kill his wife and family mm. in England, but he never stood trial for that. Yes, absolutely. And there's some similarities between the, to the two. Throat slit under the hearth yeah. in the fireplace don't know what the law is in australia and i don't know what the law would have been at the time certainly nowadays and for, for many years has been you can't have previous convictions used as evidence against you in a new court but he wasn't ever convicted so it, maybe that was the thing that here's the character witnesses yeah, well, or the, here's the... Or, well that's hearsay though isn't yeah. it it's bizarre oh that's bizarre that's a really interesting... Ca- I want to read more about this. I want to read more about this crazy, crazy flamboyant mm, man. plenty out there. Oh, the poor ladies under the fireplace. Yeah. I don't like it, Nick. Good story. Rambly though it was. It wasn't... <laughs> but it wasn't bad rambly because you tied everything together beautifully. I felt looked after I, I jumped throughout. around with my dates a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously he was Jack the Ripper. Well, obviously. I mean, it's the only, only possible explanation. Only possible explanation. He came back to England, killed a load of women, went back to Australia, then came back and then yeah, oh my god <laughs> <laughs> no. well what do you think think people do you know the story of well what name are we going to use for him well i mean Fr- frederick deming deming frederick deming was his deming his deming deming deming, D-E-M, deming. deming. Um, so that indeed was his real name so i think we should go with his actual actual name so rather frederick than his alias. but baron swanston Bra- also baron swanston name. also known as albert williams albert williams yes and mr duran don't know the first name of mr duran and mr duran all of these men what do you think of the story do you know the story are you one of our australian fans please please <laughs> please message us and write in and say whether you know it or not just say hi i'm from australia we'll all give you likes and love what were his motives was it just that 
he was that arrogant and after mm. a bit of skirt just what the hell <laughs> just so <laughs> thrown by this what outfit would you wear if you wanted to evade capture but still look fabulous well that's the important bit criminal but make it fashion mm. send right. us your suggestions send us your ideas and your thoughts comment on any of the social media posts on this episode dm us share your own thoughts and please share this story to all of your friends your family your enemies your co-workers <laughs> people that you've seen once somewhere in the street yeah. send it to them just ping it to them on the app and if you haven't already come and join us on patreon lots of extra episodes an episode every week that you can mm. enjoy on patreon lots of bonus material lots of frivolity and larks and japes and all the lovely stuff. conversations on there so do join us on patreon if you haven't already and send us more shout outs more suggestions for stories and just more musings about why poison <laughs> is just fabulous thanks for listening guys we have been the people inside the poisoner's cabinet we will see you next week and remember your loved ones are trying to kill you. Bye.